This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Aquarium Mania on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Roy Anon, speaking to you from the University of Florida's Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. Thanks for joining us. For many years, marine aquarium fish were only available from the wild. Then, in the 1970s, pioneering scientists developed methods for commercial production of clownfish. Over the years, other species, including neon gobies, dottybacks, and seahorses, also became available from fish farms. Most recently, Dr. Matt Wittenrich cracked the breeding code for the mandarin goby, one of the more popular marine fish species. Dr. Matt is a well-known marine biologist, a highly sought-after speaker, a photographer, and the author of the Complete Illustrated Breeder's Guide to Marine Aquarium Fishes. Matt recently earned his PhD at Florida Institute of Technology, studying how larval reef fish feed. Join us as Dr. Matt shares his psychedelic approach to breeding mandarin gobies. We'll be right back with Dr. Matt after these messages. Molly, here's your dinner. (coughs) Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your cat tree tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Aquarium Mania on Pet Life Radio. My guest today is Dr. Matt Wittenrich, longtime aquarium enthusiast, marine biologist, photographer, and author. Hi, Dr. Matt. Thanks for spending some time with us, and congrats on the new PhD. Uh, hi, Roy. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm very excited to have recently earned the PhD, uh, and it's great to be here on the uh, on the podcast. So thanks for having me. Well, I know many of the marine folks uh, you know, know you very well, and I think a lot of them are going to be real excited to, uh, to hear about some of the work you've done recently. <laughs> uh, I, I kind of like to start with some basic personal history questions, if you don't mind. No, absolutely. So what, what was your very first fish and or uh, tank setup? Ooh, it's been a long time ago now. It's hard to say. I've been a fish nut for a real long time. I think my very first fish tank was actually um, probably a 29-gallon tank that my dad set up. He was what I would consider a, a conservative aquarist. He had a 29-gallon tank, and uh, he, he just maintained it as a display tank. I think I was about 12 years old, and I started putting Oscars in with his angelfish and tetras and uh, quickly began experimenting from there. He soon gave me my own, my own goldfish tank shortly after that, so that would probably be the first uh, around, I'd say, 10 years old. Okay. How many aquarium tanks have you had over the years, if you can even guesstimate, and, and uh, what kinds of, how many kinds of different fish have you been keeping? Sure, yeah. It's actually a long history. It's actually a really funny story. So yeah, my, my first fish tank was a goldfish tank, a 10-gallon tank. And uh, from there, it's hard to say when the transition to, uh, I, I would say, obsession came. But I, I'd say around 12 years old, I, uh, I had bunk beds at the time, so I started setting up fish tanks on the top bunk. I ripped out the uh, clothes from my closet, put in shells, and I started raising um, anabantoids. I was really big into the uh, breeding freshwater fish for a really long time. I actually, uh, I bred piranhas. I was into uh, African cichlids for a long time, South American cichlids. I had a uh, freshwater um, anabantoid stage. Pretty much every freshwater fish group you can imagine I, I experimented with. And I had one saltwater fish tank set up sort of as a display as a display tank to offset the bare bottom breeding scheme. And, uh, you know, back when I was, I think I was 12 years old and everything I heard is that saltwater fish were impossible to raise. So I just wanted one pretty tank to, uh, to kind of offset everything. And sure enough, I had a pair of oscillators clownfish in it and uh, they spawned. So everything I heard, this was impossible. And that was kind of the, uh, the transition into the marine breeding. 
Um, I think I was 15 or 16. I heard from a rumor that they were tearing down a trout hatchery. So a friend of mine went over there and we got all the fiberglass tubs and tanks. And uh, thankfully, from very supportive parents, I set those up in the basement. So around 16 years old, I had uh, 157 glass tanks set up in the basement. Wow, that's incredible. And this is in New York, right? Yeah, this is a small town outside of Buffalo, New York. In the uh, in the wintertime, it got quite cold down there, but uh, I was determined. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was pretty excited to be doing it. So how did you make the leap from doing that as a hobby to getting into it professionally? Uh, well, again, you know, it's really interesting. I heard this quote, and I love this quote, but it's, you know, curiosity is often the best motivator in the world. And uh, just being curious about how things happen or why fish did certain things, you know, it just kind of drove me to the next level. You know, I, I always watched the fish in aquariums just to see what they were doing, and I, and I wanted to learn more, you know. So I pushed on. I got my, my undergrad at Long Island University. I wanted to go somewhere tropical, but Long Island ended up being close to the coast, so I settled for that. But it's um, an it island. Just, it's yeah, an yeah, island, though, so it's sort it, of it tropical. Is. It, was, it was close. Yeah. It was tropical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, I just I, I loved it, and I kept going with it, you know. And, and the more I learned as a scientist, it had helped me as a hobbyist and as, as a breeder. So I would say that I'm, I'm classically trained as a functional morphologist, and that has actually helped me pretty significant with the, the larval rearing and the breeding of these things. So it's actually really interesting how these things come hand in hand. So after going through your undergrad and, you know, uh, what, what made you decide to go for a PhD and maybe real, you know, really briefly explain what you, what you did with your PhD or what, you're, what you studied? <laughs> Okay. Well, what I studied quite simply is just how fish feed. Um, we know that in the wild, less than uh, 0.1% of all the eggs and uh, eggs and larvae that are spawned on, on a coral reef or in the marine or in the ocean in general uh, survive that pelagic larval period, actually survive the ocean stage to recruit back to the reef. And that's a pretty big thing. So I actually studied how, how larval fish feed, what drives their mortality, and kind of the relationships they're in. That's great. So getting to the, uh, the species of interest now that, that you, uh, you know, recently broke the code for, uh, a lot of marine hobbyists know what a mandarin goby is, but I know there's many folks out there that don't. Can you describe maybe the, real briefly the family and, and some of the more common species? Uh, sure, absolutely. Yeah, the, the first thing to mention is that the, the mandarin is not actually a goby. A lot of people call them mandarin gobies. Gobies are, are a really large family of marine fishes, mostly coral reef fishes. But the mandarins are actually a member of the, the calianimids, the actually dragonets. And the genus Syncaropus, there's actually 60 members in it, and they're mostly reef-associated fish from the, the Indo-Pacific. So in aquariums, we have the green mandarin, and that's probably the most common, most popular fish. And the spotted mandarin, uh, it's a kind of a mint green with a bright orange bullseyes. They're really pretty fish. And then we have the scooter blenny and the red scooter blenny. And these are the most common fish in the aquarium trade, but again, there's about 130 species of, of dragonets out there. And they're, they're really awesome fish. They have a really interesting method of swimming. And that's probably the most characteristic thing about mandarins or dragonets in general is how they swim. And they use those large pectoral fins to sort of undulate, hop, and skip over the bottom. So that's really the most, most noticeable thing about a mandarin, I would say. So why are they so popular? Uh, it, well, it's hard to say. You know, I, when I was first, I had my first mandarin when I was 12. And at that time, you know, you really don't have to know much about a mandarin to know that they're absolutely beautiful. You know, they call them psychedelic mandarins. And, and there's a lot to be said for that. They really are psychedelic fish. Absolutely mind-blowing color and pattern. It really, it, it's hard to rival in a marine fish. But yeah, so it really just the color, the behavior of these fish. Again, a lot of it has to do with those huge pectoral fins and the way they, they flutter and, and swim around the tank. Just really, really beautiful fish. Really unique for a saltwater fish. Now, I know and I've uh, heard and read, I had, actually haven't kept in any myself, but that they're considered more of a for expert only type fish. Why is that? Oh, they are, definitely. Again, with that first mandarin that I kept when I was 12 years old, I was heartbroken. I actually watched it slowly wither away and die. And a lot of this is because of their diet. They're just really hard to feed in captivity. In the wild, they only eat live food. And mostly what they eat are live copepods, uh, harpactacoid copepods that are sort of crawling around the bottom. And this is just a really lipid-rich food source, so they're used to constantly eating. And I like to compare this with seahorses. Seahorses, they just have a really inefficient digestive system. They're used to eating constantly throughout the day. So when we collect mandarins from the wild, they're often starved throughout the transport chain. So by the time they reach retail markets here in the States, they're often emaciated and sometimes beyond the point of no return, just really thin, pinched bellies. So I also heard that they're 
collected with some strange kind of methods. <laughs> Can you describe the uh, collection methods for these? Uh, I do. As far as I know, um, when I was in the Philippines, I sat around a, a little bamboo table talking to a, a bunch of uh, local fishermen, and they freely told me how they collected the mandarins. I wasn't able to go out with them, but what they do is they actually construct a mini bamboo spear gun. It looks sort of like a slingshot. I would say a mixture between a, a slingshot, a spear gun, and a rubber band, but they fire long double-pronged sewing needles. Again, picture a, a slingshot made with your hand with a thick rubber band, and they fire this into the, the protocol says to aim for the side, tail, or belly of the fish. The reason for that is the mandarins are, are pretty cryptic in the wild. They generally live under rocks and under corals and, and rocks and things, and they really only come out at two times during the day. They come out at dawn during feeding forays, and then at night they sort of venture above the corals to spawn. But that's really it. So if you're a Filipino collector and you need to collect a lot of these fish for the aquarium trade, you can't really get a net in there. So the easiest thing is actually get them with a spear gun. I know you've done a lot of kind of research, and do you know roughly how many... Uh of these fish kind of enter the hobby or, or any rough idea on, on sort of numbers? I do. Actually, one of the numbers that I came across was actually importation to the U.S. alone is somewhere near 150,000 mandarins. And that's a lot of mandarins. And that doesn't account for the ones that are going overseas. You know, Japan has a pretty big market. Europe has a pretty big market. But just in the U.S., there's about 150,000 every year. So now, you know, the really large males are pretty popular in the, the trade. So are there any kind of sustainability type questions or, or uh, concerns? Certainly, there's a, a real famous researcher, Yvonne Sadovi from the University of Hong Kong, and she's worked extensively with the mandarins. And what she found, again, the large males, they're larger, they have the really long dorsal filament, so they're more attractive to hobbyists, and they, I think they, they get a few cents more from the collectors. So what happens, the female mandarins, well, mandarins congregate nightly at designated spawning sites on the reef, So, and the females want to mate with the largest males out there. So when you remove the males for the aquarium trade, the females are, are forced to mate with smaller males, less experienced males. And what happens is as pelagic spawners, the two of them come together, they rise up into the water column and they shed these buoyant pelagic eggs. But when they're forced to mate with the smaller males, it becomes longer and prolonged and these spawning ascents become awkward and the pair can't quite get it right. And what she found was that when that happens, they're actually more at risk to predation. So she found that fish were actually eating them as they tried to spawn. So there are some definitely some sustainability issues with that as it kind of disrupts the social structure in the wild. So uh, explain that again. So the smaller males just are not able to swim as... Oh, well, the smaller males, no, it's not that they can't swim. It's just that they're not used to spawning. They're pretty inexperienced. So when they try to align their bodies, they just can't get it right. They're just inexperienced. So it just takes them a bit longer to get it. So when it takes them longer, they spend more time in the water column. And now an adult pair of mandarins, an experienced pair, they rise up together really slowly. And at the height of that ascent, they'll release the eggs and then shoot right back to the bottom. Okay. So they they know they're going to get eaten. They got to hurry. You like to think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, since you mentioned the size, is there a major difference in age or what's kind of the time frame or, or the age difference between the larger and the smaller males or is that something else that determines the size? Yeah, that's actually a very good question, right? I don't know that anyone's ever looked at the age structure of, of mandarins in the wild. That would be a really interesting thing to look into. But males are generally much larger than females. They have a, an exaggerated or a longer first dorsal fin. So they are sexually dimorphic. As far as age, though, I don't really know. From breeding mandarins in captivity, we can say that sexual maturity is right around 12 to 14 months is when they first begin to display reproductive habits anyway. So are there any color differences between the sexes? Not a whole lot. The males are, are a little bit brighter, um, but because they have that longer first dorsal filament, they tend to look more brighter. They hold more color. Um, generally in the face, there's a little bit more color in the males as well. Okay, so getting back, I guess, to the aquaculture portion, is aquaculture going to be the answer to uh, maybe some of the sustainability questions that, that are, are out there? I think a lot of people would like to think so. You know, I think aquaculture holds tremendous potential as far as alleviating some of the stresses from wild populations, but I think it has to be a give and take, and I, think, I don't think aquaculture will ever wholly replace the, the wild capture fisheries, and I really don't think it should. Uh, I think we really need to develop some, some sound management practices for wild capture fisheries and, and also commingle those with, with successful aquaculture. The good news now is that we do have the ability to raise these fish in captivity, um, you know, thanks to places like ORA. Now, the commercial mandarin is a reality, and they now eat pelleted food, you know, so we get back to why are mandarins so difficult to maintain in captivity, and it comes down to the diet. But these captive mandarins, they eat pellets, they're ready to go, so they, they're no longer considered a four expert only fish. Pretty much anyone who buys one of the captive raised mandarins could succeed right off the bat. Well, that's definitely great news. I guess going back to the 
wild versus the the aquaculture then in the aquarium store are you going to see both of them or are you going to see them labeled you know differently or how will you know which is which Generally, they should be. Most reputable places will certainly label them as captive-raised fish. Captive-raised fish, they're definitely more valuable, again, because of this whole survivorship. Um, they survive better. They eat pretty much everything you put in front of them. So at the end of the day, they are worth a lot more, and, and most people will list that. You will, unfortunately, also see a difference in price. It's really hard for captive growers to meet the import price of mandarins. A wild mandarin probably sells for, I think, the last pet shop I went in was around $24, where a captive-raised mandarin is probably right around the $40 mark. So there is a difference there. But if you think about the long-term goal, what you want to do, you want to see the fish survive and thrive. It's worth a few extra dollars for sure. No, I definitely agree. Well, I want to start getting into more of the breeding and and the work you, you did to figure out the best way to aquaculture these. But let's take a quick break first and hear some messages from our sponsors before we continue with uh, Dr. Matt Winrich. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com We're back and we're continuing our conversation with my guest, Dr. Matt Winrich, marine biologist and author. So, Matt, you you gave us quite a bit of good basic kind of biological and ecological information on these in the wild. And I know you've worked a lot with them and gotten a lot more kind of more personal with them, so to speak. A couple of questions, I guess. Will two males get along if you have a couple of males? What kind of structure and territoriality and that sort of thing do these fish have? Well, males in captivity definitely will not get along. They just really don't tolerate each other. Um, and it's actually kind of interesting. If you think about the males on the reef, the males kind of all, all stage, uh, again, at a certain area at night. So during the day, all these fish kind of fan out, they spread out, and they, they have their own little domains where they occupy. And then at night, they come together in the same spot. And it's really difficult to maintain sort of that same social structure in, in captivity. So when you put two males in the tank together, they, they fight pretty much constantly. What kind of space would they would you need if you were going to have more than one male? Are you talking pretty large aquarium? That, that's actually one thing I always wanted to try, but unfortunately, I just don't think we have tanks big enough yet. The interesting story, some of the, the first captive-raised mandarins that I raised, I donated to the coral reef exhibit at the Smithsonian Institute in uh, Washington, D.C., uh-huh. and there's roughly 12 captive-raised mandarins in there, and there are multiple males, and I think that's right around a 600-gallon tank. So it's a really large tank, and it's actually really awesome to watch how they behave, and they sort of behave naturally. The males kind of occupy different sides of the tank, and then right around dusk, they sort of all migrate migrate to this one prominent outcropping where they, where they spawn. The males kind of twirl around each other and display aggressively. And then they both spawn and go about their separate sides. So it's oh, quite interesting. That is. That's very interesting. So let's talk about the, uh, the whole spawning process and everything you kind of went through to figure out what to do. I guess maybe starting with what made you decide you wanted to breed these fish. Right. It's actually, again, a really interesting stories. So in 2007, my book was published, uh, The Complete Illustrated Breeder's Guide to Marine Aquarium Fishes. It was uh, published by TFH Microcosm. And shortly after that, a lot of people started asking why mandarins weren't in the book. And what I thought about it, the actual answer was quite simple. I never really thought about it. Um, but since then, you know, I started looking into message boards. There was... Um, And this is what's great about the modern aquarium hobby that we have is there are so many people engaged in all these things and keeping mandarins alive and and trying to figure all these things out. So there's a bunch of online resources now. There's MOFIB, the Marine Ornamental Fish and Invertebrate Breeders website, and there's um, MBI, a Marine Breeding Initiative. And all these message boards and all these hobbies are coming together to try and basically open access to information and how do we figure all this stuff out. So I started searching these out and there's a bunch of hobbyists actively um, spawning mandarins 
Indians. Um, not a whole lot of success, but they were actively spawning them. And most notably, uh, a guy, Matt Peterson. Um, he's a, a well-known breeder um, up in Minnesota now. And it, he started posting all of these videos and all this information about how to wean mandarins onto f- prepared foods, how to condition them, and, and how, basically how they spawned. But I, I still wasn't convinced that it was going to be easy. But I kept at it, and I kept researching all these things. And eventually, I came across an image, a picture that Matt Peterson posted of the larvae. And this is sort of where the science of it comes back into it, and especially the, the functional morphology side. So I, I think it was a three-day-old mandarin larva that he posted. And I looked at the jaw structure of all things of that picture, and I just thought to myself, now that I could raise. So literally the next day, I went out, bought a pair of mandarins. And uh, within a week, I think they were spawning. And that's when the whole saga began. So did um, Matt have problems with raising the juvenile then? That- um, I, I think he did. Most people, the problem with mandarins as a pelagic spawner, um, the larvae are quite tiny. What's most remarkable about the mandarins, I, I think the whole dragonet family um, in particular, is that they exhibit some of the smallest larvae known in the ocean of any marine fish. At first feeding, the larvae measure about 1.8 millimeters. So for comparison, a clownfish hatches out and begins feeding at 4 millimeters. So mandarin at first feeding is roughly half the size. So it's just really difficult to figure out what to feed them and, and sort of how they eat. So you took us to the pair you have there spawning. So then, then what was the next step? Um, well, to trigger a mandarins to eat, um, it's, it's actually a really simple thing. Well, it's really simple and not simple. The hardest part is obtaining a healthy pair of mandarins. Again, when, when you look for mandarins at a, at a pet shop, I like to look for, for specimens that are alert and full-bodied, full of vigor and, and health. Um, the thing about mandarins is they are, are downright hardy fish. They are a really durable fish. They have a really thick slime coat that makes them pretty much immune to most common diseases like amlodinium or cryptocarion. They always seem alert. Even if they're emaciated and look like they're at the point of no return, they're still actively alert, um, picking at the bottom for food. Um, unfortunately, it's just really hard to bring them back from that state of health. So what I do is uh, there's a mysis shrimp made from Piscine Energetics, and the mysis shrimp are just really loaded with lipids. And, and again, mandarins are used to eating throughout the day almost constantly. So it's really about getting that body condition back, feeding them all the food you can in the world, getting them to eat that, that frozen mysis shrimp, and really just boosting up their overall health. A lot of people say that mandarins, like a male and a female, won't get along in the confines of an aquarium. And what that is, really, it's because of the body condition. If mandarins are, are in a state of poor body, they won't court. Reproduction really isn't the first thing on their mind, and they're going to defend a feeding territory to try to get their body condition back up. So really, it's about feeding them as much as you can, just really lipid-rich food like PE mysis shrimp, and then just putting the lights on a timer so they have constant light cycle, and, and they'll spawn before you know it. So you mentioned a pelagic stage. How long, I guess, maybe a little bit about the development, does it take for them to hatch? And when would they be feeding and that sort of thing too? Right, right. So compared to clownfish, if we can just compare this, because this is something that most people would be familiar with. But clownfish lay their eggs on a rock or in captivity, they usually lay them on a tile or a rock next to the anemone. And the eggs sit there and the male takes care of the eggs for about seven days. And then the larvae hatch out of the egg and and swim basically up to the top of the tank. And from there, you take the larvae out into a, a rearing tank. Mandarins spawn much differently. Since they're pelagic spawners, they release tiny eggs. They're about 0.8 millimeters in diameter. And so the pair will come up together. They'll slowly rise into the water and shed anywhere. My spawns were always pretty low numbers. I would say from 50 to two to 500 eggs. And there are several ways of getting the eggs out. But what I did was actually take a water bottle or an empty water bottle, turn off all the filters so the eggs are just floating right at the surface film. And you just take that water bottle and slowly collect the eggs to skim them off the surface. And then we just simply hatch or put them in a like an Artemia hatching cone or an inverted soda bottle. And the difference is that these eggs actually hatch out in about 13 hours. And when they hatch, they don't really look like much. They look like a little glass sliver. They don't have eyes. They don't have a mouth. Pretty odd looking little little larvae. And it takes them about three days to develop to the point of, of feeding. So, so in that time, they'll develop eyes, they'll develop a mouth and all the fins and, and sensory systems that, that allow them to feed. So it takes right around three days for them to start feeding. And I, you know, I forgot to ask you, you mentioned that, that they would start spawning. So pretty much as soon as they're conditioned, they'll just start spawning for you? Or was there any specific trigger that you needed? There's not really any specific trigger. It's really just the health of the mandarins. I think when I got that first pair, I was lucky that I actually obtained really healthy fish right off the bat. So I think they started spawning in about 12 days. But since that time, again, it really depends on the the overall body condition of the fish when you get them. Uh, Sometimes it can take a really long time to boost the energy reserves of a a wild-caught mandarin. 
and how often would they spawn for you? Or what's this kind of cycle? Well, yeah, that's another good question. Most of the reports that I've read online state that the mandarins spawn every three days or so. What's interesting about the original pair that I maintained, and then I think about six pairs uh, later on, I I did some just really crude studies. Um, But when I fed them uh, this really lipid-rich, again, this P.E. mysa shrimp, uh, it's funny because when you can get enough energy into them, it turns out that they actually spawn twice a night, every single night. So and you take a fish like that that's considered to spawn once every three nights – and my fish were spawning twice a night. So I often wonder, is it, are most pairs spawning twice a night and people just aren't realizing it? Or if this is just something new just because of the, the amount of food they were getting. So it's something really interesting, especially for the wild fish, if they are spawning twice a night. Yeah, that is definitely interesting. So I guess getting back to the, the development then. So there, you said about three days to develop to feeding. Then what do you do? Well, three days to develop a mouth and three days to develop to that first feeding point. And and again, for me, I I really didn't know uh, what to expect with these mandarins. And and again, sort of the the protocol or the what I always want to figure out is we have this bottleneck. Most people are used to feeding the traditional aquaculture fare that is rotifers and artemia. Uh, Unfortunately, there's just a lot of fish out there that we maintain in captivity that just won't eat rotifers and artemia in the larval form. So the next step in in aquaculture is really to, to determine what what these fish are going to eat. And, and how I did that is I basically go out to the ocean with, a, with a, a basically a glorified pantyhose, uh, a plankton net, and I, I sieve out all of the microscopic zooplankton out there in Florida that we have. And we, we size sort it, we sieve it, we get rid of uh, some of the bigger things, the nasty things, and then we, we feed that, we offer that to the larvae. And the, the larvae basically tell us what they want to eat, what what out of everything in the plankton they want to eat. So eventually, I was able to isolate a certain few species of copepods from that plankton and sort of start cultures of that. So pretty interesting how all that worked. And and what they ate sort of changes through development as well. But it turns out that larval mandarins will eat rotifers. They just don't really survive that well on it. So how often did you have to switch the different live foods when you said that they kind of changed through development? Was it every couple days or... Really, for me, the protocol didn't change that much. Again, I offered them pretty much everything that was available in the ocean uh, just to see what they would eat and what, how that sort of diet changed through development. Um, and again, once I figured out what they were eating at certain times, then I, I tried to culture those things or figure out how to culture the, the organisms that they were eating and eventually just offer them that. So, okay. So how long does it take for them to actually get the color that people want? Yeah, the the larval cycle of a mandarin is actually really interesting. So in this pelagic larval period, the time when they don't really look like a fish, they're kind of uh, just look like these oblong, really odd creatures, uh, bright orange swimming in the uh, the upper water column. It takes them about 16 days to actually settle down to the bottom. And they're really cryptic and they blend in really well with the, the detritus on the bottom and the sand and the pebbles. And then about, so 56 days roughly after spawning, they begin to look like a little mandarin. So they get the, uh, the bright green color, the bright blue swirls on the side. Really, really pretty fish. And about how big are they at that point? When they first settle out, this is actually really cool, but when they first settle out of the water and hit the bottom, they're about the size of a clownfish when it hatches. They're about four millimeters. And it, it sort of makes uh, commercial culture difficult, too, when you're trying to siphon the bottom of the tank and there's all these little four millimeter long mandarins kind of hiding on the bottom. Wow. So that's when they're getting the color as well, or is it shortly thereafter? Shortly thereafter. So the mandarins, again, they'll hit metamorphosis and settle to the bottom around 16 to 20 days after hatching. And then uh, another 30 days after that is when they they sort of develop the color of what you're used to seeing as a mandarin. Before that, they're just kind of mottled brown little little guys hopping around. And so I guess for that size, then when they're actually colored up, what would that be about like eight millimeters or oh yeah that's actually um well probably around five or six millimeters they're still okay. quite small so they're still okay so they haven't grown that much okay yeah. what other species of dragonets have you raised well since the the initial success with the the green mandarin um I, I just thought it would be neat to see if the other ones were like that so i raised the spotted mandarin which is another really interesting one and the spotted mandarin is actually a little bit easier to raise than the green they reach metamorphosis in 12 days mostly uh so that's pretty awesome for uh for a pelagic spawner to reach metamorphosis Metamorphosis that quick is a, is a really cool thing. They are, are small and they're, they're pretty tough to raise still, but they're pretty neat. And then the, the Scooter Blenny and the Red Scooter Blenny I've also raised. And what's interesting about these group is it seems like the uglier you get in the Dragonette world, the more difficult you are to raise. So the <laughs> Scooter Blenny and the Red Scooter Blenny are actually a little bit more difficult to raise. And I think you've kind of alluded to it, but maybe for the, the folks that aren't 
real familiar with the term. Can you explain metamorphosis and what that means? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, metamorphosis in, in its general form just means a marked transformation from sort of one form to the other. So what we mean, speaking about larval reef fishes, is the time when they transition from the, the upper water column to sort of the bottom of the water when they hit the reef again. So basically we take a streamlined larva um, we're really with... Um, Actually, when, it, when a larva first hatches out, it doesn't have gills. Um, it actually breathes through its skin. And eventually, it develops scales, develops all the fins. So basically, metamorphosis is just a large transformation from that larval form to the juvenile form. Okay. So so you mentioned ORA and their um, work with the mandarins now. They're pumping out a lot of these fish at this point? Uh, absolutely, yeah. ORA and the uh, the successful commercial of the mandarins, in my eyes, is really one of the, the most significant things to have happened in aquaculture over the last decade. It's actually really an, an awesome thing. No one ever thought that you could commercially raise mandarins because they have such a slow growth rate. It was often estimated that mandarins would grow about an inch a year. So to reach three inches, uh, what would roughly be considered a saleable mandarin would, would take you three years. And there's just no way that would be a, a commercial option. But again, the, the guys at ORA, ORA is is packed full of just really experienced, really dedicated people uh, led by Dustin Dorton, the, the president down there. Um, and they were able to actually quicken the grow out time. And it's just really amazing. They, they've worked out the, some of the kinks in the, in the larval rearing cycle and gotten some pretty good survivorship with the mandarins. So it's just really amazing um, in the last three years to, to go from no breeding of mandarins to now they have two species o- available on their, on their list. So it, it's quite, quite impressive. Yeah, that, definitely, I agree. And, and I think our listeners may be familiar with Dustin Dorton. We uh, interviewed him a while back. So it's definitely, uh, as you mentioned, a great, a great thing for the hobby and for uh, those folks. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, um, but I really did want to thank our guest, Dr. Matt Winrich, and our producers, especially Mark Winter, for making the show possible. Matt, did you have any final words for our listeners? Yeah, well, well, first of all, thanks so much for having me on, Roy. One of the things that I wanted to say is, you know, my success with the mandarins, I wasn't the first person to breed mandarins, and I certainly won't be the last. Uh, but one thing that I think the mandarins really highlights is this open exchange or free exchange of information. Um, now we have the internet and we have tons of marine hobbyists engaged in, in not only breeding marine fishes, but simply the observations about how these things spawn and what the larvae look like. And this is all really important. So eventually we can all get to the goal of, of giving that technology and that information to places like ORA so that we can really make an overall impact in the trade. Great. Excellent, excellent words. And you're right. I think uh, there's so much information out there now. If, you know, folks like you have done a, a lot to kind of help pool this information and really, I think, add the science, which is a major use of, of information. If there's information out there, but people aren't really pulling it together in a cohesive manner, then it, you know, it's, it's not going to be as useful, obviously. Um, right, exactly. Yep. Thanks again, Dr. Matt, for joining us. I encourage all of you to visit my Aquarium Mania blog on Pet Life Radio. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for a show, email me at drroy, that's D-R-R-O-Y, at PetLifeRadio.com, drroy at PetLifeRadio.com. If you're ever in Florida, please be sure to visit the Aquarium Mania exhibit at the Florida Aquarium in Tampa, one of my favorite aquariums. Until next time, please visit your local aquarium stores, buy more fish, and keep your tanks and fish healthy, and be sure to keep an eye out for aquaculture mandarin gobies. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.